What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Mehran Podcast. Today, my guest is Jeff Thomas. Jeff is one of the most accomplished filmmakers in skiing. He's produced a bunch of movies with his company, Theory 3, back in the 2000s. He has worked on some of my favorite Poor Boys movies like Every Day is a Saturday and Revolver. He then went on to work with Salomon Free Ski TV for a bunch of years and has recently been working more and more with the Blank Collective crew. Jeff is a great filmmaker, a great dude, and it was really interesting talking about skiing, filmmaking, and a bunch of other stuff with him. Big thank you to this episode's sponsors, Axis Board Shop, Tree Fort Lifestyles, J Skis, and Planks Clothing. Let's go. Mr. Jeff Thomas, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Really glad to have you. How you been? Yeah, pretty well. Uh, life is good. We've just kind of wrapped up generally skiing around here. So office work and all the snow is melting out, playing golf, stuff like that. <laughs> What's your winter been like? Have you been working full time on the new Blank movie? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, like most of my time this winter because of COVID, I t decided to work kind of extra full time with Alexi and Stan on the movie and Yeah, basically dive in more than I had previously, more on the filming side. I always was directing and editing, but uh, but uh, this year filmed yeah, kind of like 75% of my time with those guys. So that was pretty fun. Nice. Am I right to say that Blank up to now, apart from a bit of Alaska, was mostly filmed in BC? Uh, Tahoe, BC, pretty much. Those are kind of the two places, obviously. A bit of Washington State. Those guys went to Japan once or twice, stuff like that. But uh, obviously things of travel get a bit expensive. Yeah, so we kind of pool our money and do it or a little bit more locally or where the athletes are from mm -hmm. so we can save some money. You guys are still all set to do what you got to do, right? Yeah, we just stayed a little bit more even hyper local and just said, okay, cool. Kind of probably the same as lots of people are going to kind of explore your backyard or that kind of vibe. But uh, we definitely ch challenged ourselves to find some different zones, not like saying new zones with places that maybe weren't filmed before that much mm -hmm. so like chris rubens is an example had some places he went to in the past that he was like let's go and it wasn't maybe a typical filming terrain but it was yeah. uh, really unique and it was fun and honestly with covid as well unfortunately with covid i should say uh, a lot of like cat skiing and heli ski and touring lodges were either mm -hmm. closed or barely open so we got opportunities to go to places that we normally wouldn't be allowed to, not that we wouldn't be allowed to go to they were already booked out previously yeah. so we got a a whole bunch of pretty cool opportunities from just, yeah, uh, the season being extra quiet in BC and no international travel. Mm -hmm. I talked to Felix Rieu, who's now in charge of uh, marketing yeah. at Shake Shack in the totally. Shake Shacks. Yeah. And he was telling me about that. We had, a, I don't know how it was in BC, but they had bubble restrictions for their lodging. So for each of their lodging spots, they could only have one bubble, mm -hmm. which means that if they had a place where they could lodge 20 people, If there was a couple taking it, well, it was only two of them for the whole bubble. So basically, they were operating at a loss for all winter. It's pretty similar to from what I, you know, I think the rules in BC were probably a tiny bit different, but it was kind of like numbers were super small, right? So same kind of thing. I'm sure everyone was operating in a general loss format or a, a barely break even. Or, you know, I think our opportunities were just because people last minute would cancel. You know, mm. they were like probably holding out hope, even if they were American or from Europe or even other parts of Canada. Like, but then ultimately mm -hmm. they realized they couldn't go. And so we just would be like, hey, we'll join in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You talked a bit about reinventing or finding new spots. That's something that happened to me uh, filming Street in Montreal, where you can find as much as you can search as much as you'd like, but at a certain point you're going to go back to some old spots you're going and then the whole challenge is to reinvent it you know is there something like that for you guys in the back country because i guess at some point it's like oh well we can sled for three hours and find a new zone but that's kind of shitty at some point totally yeah i think it kind of again alexi stan and i talked this year about like okay well if we can't travel as much and we might be well we always film around whistler anyways because it's generally good It's exactly what you're saying. It's like, what are we going to try to do a little bit differently? To, yeah, to make it, you know, fun, I guess, and 
different. I don't want to have to say it that way, but yeah, we challenge ourselves to either find new like filming techniques, whether it's, you know, FPV or high speed cameras or like way fat, more gimbal work or like, a, you know, taking inspiration from mountain bike movies being like, okay, they film it this way. No one films like that way in skiing and tree skiing. So we're going to try and try to like, yeah, just spin a little bit of something that we've obviously areas that we filmed before and places that we like to film and mm -hmm. just felt one film it in a different way. And then secondly, it's like, okay, you're going to go into a pillow zone or like a kicker kind of area. It's like, is there a different way to do it? That's, you know, something yeah. that, and I actually would say like a few different athletes that we filmed with this year, Cole Richardson, a young up and coming rock star of a kid. He kind of, I'll give him huge credit, looks at the mountain a little bit differently. So then it would be like a little bit, you'd see Stan or Alexi or Rubens or anyone else be like, Oh yeah, sweet. Never thought of it that way. Let's go for it. So it was even just a new set of eyes on the same terrain that we've had uh, was kind of fun to see how that could get tweaked. So, yeah. You talked about trying some new ways of filming stuff. I saw you post a story or maybe it was Alexi last fall where you bought kind of a electronic cable cam. Yeah. How, how would you qualify it? Yeah, it was an electronic cable cam. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, it was cool. It's like, uh, you could put a black, little black magic on it or a GoPro. Um, it was probably just enough in length for, I think it's about 500 feet or 400 feet of cable that comes with the product. And, uh, we were like, yeah, you probably saw us playing with it in my front yard. And we were curious to see if it would actually work in the winter because of cold, because of wet uh cameras batteries all that kind of stuff and it worked pretty well um actually uh i it was obviously tree skiing isn't it what we used it for like cable cams like mountain bike movies and uh, yeah we got a couple shots that'll show up in the movie and we definitely learned how we would do it next year which was kind of fun it definitely was trial and error like next year we'll by the end of the i think we set one up in march on kind of the one of the last like pow storms that i saw coming and we set one up and let it went up okay it was we knew it was going to snow eight or 12 inches 20 30 centimeters overnight so we kind of like set it up kind of set the plan and then came back the next day and reshot it so we knew exactly like we did some test shots on it and then it snowed again so i think little things like that for next year also i was going to hit that company up i think they're called viral and say hey we need a cable that's like two or three times longer that would be kind of sweet uh and then uh, then it would be really cool but yeah there's going to be two or three shots in the movie and that was fun to you know, just try something new. It's like, again, like tree skiing is not like anything new. So it's like, hey, how can we make, make a dynamic, interesting tree skiing segment? So it's like cable cams, rapid panning, super tight, super slow-mo. Yeah, it's kind of a, be a pretty cool little segment we worked on. Yeah, the perspective must be really nice with the cable going through the trees. Yeah, there is a shot, one shot, the one probably the best shot is like Ian Morrison just kind of like cruising pow. And he skis very fast already, but he had pure kind of it's hard because it's like a, a romo control and i'm like standing at the bottom so i'm trying to guess or slightly to the side guess how fast he's skiing in relation to how much i have to like turn the joystick which it can go up to like i think 30 miles an hour so it goes pretty fast and you're like watching him you're trying to speed it up and at one point he hammers like a pretty solid trenchy turn you know neck deep pow and he's like three feet away from the gopro in like super slow-mo so that was actually a really cool moment where it's like as you're saying, trees ripping by and then like, boom, deep pow turn. So that was kind of sweet. <laughs> That's sweet. Yeah. And now it's time for a first sponsor break. Tree Fort Lifestyles is a company based out of Oregon. They've been involved in the ski industry since their inception in 2011 when they made their first pair of suspenders for skiing. They produce some of the nicest accessories you can find out there for your adventure activities, whether you're going skiing, hiking or traveling. I've worn their suspenders all winter and I have to say I love them. They're stylish and they're so comfortable you forget you have them on in the first place. Go check them out at treefortlifestyles.com and use code MERAN at checkout to get 15% off your order. Support companies that support skiing, support Tree Fort Lifestyles. So we're talking a bit about this winter. I want to go back to the beginning with you. Because you're, you're a filmmaker I've been looking up to since I, I was a teenager. Basically, you've done a lot in skiing. Thank and you. I don't know much about your backstory. Like I've seen some posts throughout Instagram of you. I think I posted it yesterday. Yeah, yeah, doing yeah. It. What trick was that on the photo uh, I posted? Yeah, it was probably like a flare tail grab from 2001. That's crazy. Like uh, yeah. I went into filming because I was not as good as the other people, but I never did a flare with a tail grab. Like it, that's still a... <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. I tried to 
tried to be a skier for a little while there. <laughs> so tell me about your uh, how it started. Where did you where do you come from? Sure, I'll give you the ba- I'll give you the I'll give you the background of I'm from uh, West Vancouver in North Vancouver over in North Shore of Vancouver, and uh, grew up skiing at uh, generally speaking Whistler Blackcomb with my family. My grandparents had a small condo up there that uh, we, yeah, it was like, you know, classic family weekend warriors would, you know, pile into our car and go up and go in kids camp from the age of whatever, you know, three years old. And my sister and I and cousins would, yeah, just, you know, go skiing. And then I never actually was all that. I was into skiing, I suppose, but uh, I was more into other sports like baseball, actually. My family's huge into baseball. I'll give my grandpa who's passed away, but a big shout out. He's in the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. So like my family was pretty big into baseball. So I spent a lot of time at baseball until I realized I wasn't going to be as good as maybe my dad and stuff. No offense, dad. When I was like, all right, well, maybe I should find a new sport. And I'd started to kind of maybe around the age of 12, get really in, start more like enjoy those days up on the hill doing spread eagles, trying to do a 360, stuff like that. And then by the time I was like 15, 16, baseball was awesome, but I was kind of getting over seven days a week of that. So uh, he put me in a ski camp. Uh, he actually, we were skiing actually, which were black home in like May, whatever that would have been, 98. And uh, he's like, hey, Jeff, like you seem to be really, really liking skiing. Like, would you, instead of maybe spending so much time playing baseball this summer, do you want to try like a ski camp? I was like, yeah, that seems pretty cool. And, he, he'd, and I always say it's his fault that I fell into this life because he pulled out two pamphlets like from the bottom of the mountain. One said, hi, North Ski Camp. And the other one was Camp of Champions. And I was like, whoa, what is this? I'm like reading through all this stuff. And I kind of, you know, I'd seen like Jean-Luc Broussard and all that stuff. And like Johnny Mosley in 98 and like all of like the mogul freestyle aspect. But I didn't know anything more about like, you know, twin tip skiing or any of that stuff. But then I started reading the pamphlets and talking about like, yeah, Vinny, JP, like the X Games, this and that. And I was like, whoa, this seems really cool. So I went to High North Ski Camp the first year they had it. Um, I think there was like, I don't remember, 15 campers in this. I think they had two sessions. Went to that, met a, I kind of fell in love with it instantly. Yes. Huge tables, big jumps, like there's like moguls racing. The whole, you know, summer camp vibe is insane. I was 15 years old. I was like, this is cool. I was like, you know, doing daffies, barely could do a 360, you know. And then there's like watching JF, JP and stuff do, they were shooting the movie like Degenerates, I think. Or 13. No, 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 it wouldn't have been 13. I think it was either State of Mind or Degenerates. And, and yeah, watching those guys, met Johnny DeCesare from Poor Boys there. And I just like instantly like fell in a whole new light. I was like obsessed with it. Like it became my life. The next year, it was like bought twin tips up on the glacier. Actually, uh, JT Holmes, of all people, he wouldn't even probably remember this. Like, I think I was partly rooming in his room and he was like a bit older than me, but he saw my like shitty straight skis so he like gave me a pair of twin tips like that and you know <laughs> never <laughs> really like or i think he had a pair of mogul skis that he had burnt the tails up on and gave them to me and stuff like that so anyways i ended up falling in love with it from that moment on and yeah i met johnny de cesare and just kind of like he was super cool i kept t- talking to him every year i'd go actually i went back to high north three years in a row uh one year i was a digger and then in uh, all the other years i was just a camper and yeah i just kind of got better <laughs> and uh kind of just yeah like every i'd ski like 120 days a year every i luckily where i grew up in west van was only like 15 minutes up to like grouse mountain and cypress mountain so i'd go up and then night skiing so i'd just go hit the park or go shred around like every day as you probably did too like so much of my life like hop on the shuttle bus go up ski come back at nine o'clock at night get up go back go to school go up and do it so and then yeah that was that was kind of how it all started. <laughs> Crazy. So when you went to the summer camps and you say you fell in love, was filmmaking part of that? Or at that point, it was just skiing? I filmed my, like, at that moment, I was probably, let's see, grade 10, 9 or 10. So I was probably taking a photography class in high school and maybe used my parents' like high 8, 8 mil camera to film my friends. And I think we did like a little video. And then the next year, because of skiing, I like wanted to use that video camera a bit more. And I was in like whatever media arts 10 or something and kind of like was like, Oh, what is this Adobe premiere thing on the little like old school blue Mac? Like, 
And yeah, so I had a teacher, Mr. Izernia, I remember him, <laughs> and he was awesome. He just like let me make instead of doing like the school projects I was probably supposed to do, he just like make, let me make ski movies. <laughs> so, which is awesome. That's so. great because it's always um, a different pathway for everyone to get into it. Really, I was talking to Felix Rio again, and I was asking him, "Okay, you got to a point where you were traveling the world as a photographer, but how did you get there?" Yep. And he was telling me, like, I always had someone in my family or surroundings that had cameras. So I started with that. And then around end of high school, I had some uh, photography class. And anyways, and then he was really into the rollerblading scene yeah, back yeah. in those days. So that's, right. th that's his starting point. So there's always like kind of a, uh, a way that everyone has. For me, it was having a big brother that was good in skateboarding and skiing. So it was always like, Yeah. He's better than me, so okay, I'll film him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Having your cameras in your hand, you're like, oh, that's fun. I'll, I'll just keep doing that. Yeah, yeah. It is. Everyone has their little like obsession with it, and you know, I was like just stoked to film my friends because we were all like, you know, eating shit, learning tricks, like just kind of general carnage in like '99, 2000, like all that. Like everyone's learning tricks. We'd watch them in movies, huck ourselves, and just disintegrate our bodies. But <laughs> see yeah. what's possible. Totally, yeah. So did you ever have um, ambitions of a ski career as a pro when you were really into it, going to camps and skiing 120 days, like you said? I definitely had ambitions. Uh, I tried, like, sure. Went to, like, the U.S. Open and uh, whatever, probably 2001. Did a whole bunch. I did, like, used to travel around to, like, all the, like, pretty much similar to what you would see in Montreal and Quebec and St. Sever and all that area, like all the small local contests, like BC and Washington state had a bunch. Actually, I had to go down to Washington state and like do like the Mount Baker big air or like the Schweitzer Eider whole stomp games or whatever they were called and just travel around trying to, you know, mm -hmm. compete. And then went to the, the biggest contest would have been like the U S open and 2001 and it did okay, I suppose. But yeah, I definitely was like, wow, people are really good down here. I was like, I had never like slid a rail and I'd like learned that I had to slide, like do rails to go to that. They were going to have like two rails. I was like, oh my God. So it was like pretty funny to like go have to learn to do rails to go to like a major contest because out here there was like a, I don't even think a park had a rail. <laughs> so yeah, I tried and then I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> I smoked my head too many times is what I would honestly say is I had some sponsors and some free gear, you know, and then I decided it wasn't good enough. And I liked filming people that were better than me. And I kind of got tired of hitting my head so hard. So I definitely smoked my head when I was in grade 12. And it didn't come out very well. So I uh, realized I should slow it down a bit. And then I went back to I did keep competing a bit. But as I was doing that, I started filming more guys that I would meet on like, uh, at contests like Andy Mayer, like the old pro skier, I would meet I met him like at a Mount Baker, Big Air, Anthony Bernowski, old old pros from back in the day where I just met skiing or while we were on these little contest circuits and like mm -hmm. it was like man they're way better than me I should just film these guys <laughs> <laughs> so, or it would be fun we'd all go out and build a booter after the contest you know and that was way more fun so we just film it instead so yeah there's lots of guys along the way yeah same thing for me on my side in Quebec where me and my brother were really into it and we liked it and as you said there were a lot of local competitions so we were like hey we love it why not compete You know, we were not thinking of winning, just like, hey, there's a, a happening. Let's do it. Totally. And then we get there and there's 14-year-old Alex Belmar doing a six ons. And we're like, holy fuck. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah might not be a good idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I got to do, wow, I got to do some extra big tricks. But uh, anyways, yeah, it was fun. And now it's time for a second sponsor break. Planks is a British outerwear brand founded in the French Alps. Yeah, you can ski in the UK, but you probably wouldn't. But these guys are still passionate about skiing and as someone from Quebec, I definitely relate to that. They don't just make high quality, good looking gear that's affordable. They care about the free ski culture too, running grassroots events and sporting skiers that are some of my favorites like Woodsy, Lupe Haggerty and the Real Skiffy Crew. Make sure to check them out at planksclothing.com. Support companies that support skiing, support Planks Clothing. How did that transition go to start uh, Theory 3? So yeah, like uh, there was all these guys that were filming and really as we're doing it, I was making movies sometimes with guys that like with Matt Harvey of New Schoolers and this guy, Matt Schwagler and Dave Levin, another guy that was around and 
I would have been like 2002 during that time of like me going to high north, me going to university, me wanting to be a pro skier, but not realizing I was shitty, uh, comparatively speaking. So I was like giving, I'd send Johnny to Cesare, um, my movie I'd make with my buddies every year. And I give him so much credit because he'd feed back on it. He'd write me, you know, in a little email that was like, oh, I got your movie, dude. I really liked it. Like, oh, I like the music or try this or try that. He'd always give like a really positive critique. And uh, because of that, I kept me motivated. And I do remember being so hyped to like finish that movie. And I didn't care if my friends or family liked it. <laughs> I just wanted Johnny to see it. I remember that feeling. And when he would write me back, you know, like whatever, a couple weeks or a month later, I was like so stoked, you know, I was like 17, 18 or whatever, 19. And that kind of, while going to film school, I was getting better, kind of stoked me up. And uh, that gave us the idea of like, oh, maybe should try to make a movie and sell it, you know. Um, and with his like, help he kind of was like do it so I'd, yeah some of us formed a little company called theory three for a while i kind of ultimately just ran it um because i registered it as an actual like limited company did that for five years uh and it started with a guy named tyler foreman and grant gunderson actually the photographer but grant and i were like you're a photographer i make movies we'll just still be buddies but you don't, he didn't want to like actually own a movie company and there was no real money in it at that time. You know, we all put up like a thousand bucks or something, but realized it was kind of like, oh, well, I had all the gear. Why don't we just do that? Tyler lived down in the States and he was doing his own thing. He was like, he was actually Andy Mayer's cousin and they like, we were still competing. So it was kind of like, I'll just run with it myself. And then, yeah, I guess, yeah, whatever that was, 2003 through film school. And then uh, it started to pick up steam a couple of years later. So, yeah. so you went to film school in college, right? Yep. So there was already that passion or drive or whatever you call it to go towards filmmaking. Yeah, I definitely didn't want to do anything else. <laughs> I was like, I've always, and I tell people now that I'm older, I'm like, if you're that and probably the same for you, when you're passionate and stoked and excited about what you're going to do, you're only going to do it better. Mm -hmm. So for me, like, I just wanted to make ski movies and I was like, wanted to film whether other sports even too, but uh, I was definitely like, all right, I'm going to pursue the thing that makes me the most happy. And it just happened to be filming skiing uh, was my way to like, yeah, use, <laughs> use going to film school as an excuse to learn more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So were you thinking of filmmaking as ski movies only like were you centered around that or were you also like kind of a cinema junkie uh, watching uh, the classics and i definitely enjoyed like the like the craft of filmmaking the more i learned about it i definitely at times was a bit i kind of laughed at myself i was a little more into like like we'll call it like uh landscape cinematography and like action and that kind of stuff than I was into like deeper storytelling of like not storytelling. I've always enjoyed like documentary style storytelling, but lesser like scripted storytelling mainly because I just, it wasn't, I'm not a, I would say I'm not a bad writer, but I'm not a good writer. So therefore I think great writers are way better at that aspect. So um, yeah, enjoyed being a bit of a cinema nerd, especially when I was in like old, more of like a, I went to different kinds of film school. I went to BCIT at the end, which was way more hands-on like, learn how to light, learn how to edit, film law, like very practical, you know, had camera gear was like, you go out and shoot projects, you get graded on your success if you know how to color grade and all that kind of stuff. The other stuff I did was at SFU and then, and then in Carleton in Ottawa. And that was like, sit, watch movies, write essays. And that was a little bit like boring and kind of lame, to be honest. <laughs> I, I just wanted to grab a camera and go try to make something, you know, rather yeah. than talk about it. <laughs> When you say Carlton, the only thing that comes into my mind is that four kink, or is it six kink? Four I think kink? it's like six, man. Yeah, the Crichton six kink with him and uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Scott Hibbard, and yeah, that big one. That thing's sweet. <laughs> I'd walk past it every once in a while, being like, I would never try this. <laughs> Did you ever go and film it? Yeah, did I film that one? I filmed the guy. Uh, you may know the name, Andy Stewart. He's a young rollerblader, but uh, he was like kind of in the Ontario free skiing scene and went down to things like, and he did some of the X game qualifier stuff. He was pretty good. And he, he was really good at urban. So we'd go around like, cause I just wanted to film. I'd film him and another young guy, Charles Grant, who was from Ontario. So we'd go out and shoot rails out 
yeah, all through, like, yeah, on everywhere in Montreal. And I had some good friends out in Montreal named uh, Simon Thompson, who's a guide out here. He was in a bunch of the old Meathead film movies. So I'd go out and we'd all go and, yeah, shoot handrails. <laughs> <laughs> so, pretty fun, actually. You said that Johnny de Cesare had a big role as a mentor for you. Big time, yeah. There's so many guests that I've talked to that were saying that about someone for uh, Phil Casabon and Belmar, it was J.P. Eau Claire. And for, for everyone, there's someone different who takes the time to to give you time of their time and of their knowledge and everything. Um, yeah, how big of a role was that? Because eventually you worked for Poor Boys with Poor Boys, with Johnny D. Uh, before that, your Theory 3 movies were kind of in a partnership with them. I don't know in the yep. detail of how that worked out, but yeah, tell me about uh, your relationship with him. Yeah, no, Johnny was, like like you said, my biggest mentor especially at that age um i've had other ones i would say after but uh yeah like that 20 to 25 year 18 to 25 year old jeff was like obsessed with poor boys movies thought they were the coolest and johnny was like so instrumental in that um in regards to like yeah he just gave me the time of the day and like over time some of the guys i would be filming would end up in the poor boys movies so it was kind of cool like he started joking a little bit of like the farm team aspect, uh, like Zach Davison and other dudes were all in my movies and they would just over time end up in Johnny's movie, which was super cool. And like you said, they, we did have, uh, I think, a one, two, three, I think four of them, they sold, I made probably six movies, I think through theory three officially. And then, uh, Johnny at whatever, after me sending him one, one time was like, Oh, maybe, uh, we could sell some of these for you. Like I have some distributors and, New Zealand and Japan, uh, would you be interested? And I was like, uh, of course. I'm like, just tell me what I need to do, which would be like, okay, you got to get, you know, professionally printed. Here's some contacts, blah, blah, blah. You go get DVDs made, covers, whatever. And he would then, you know, I'd send whatever at the time. It was probably 1,500 DVDs down to LA and he'd sell them off and send me a check. And that ultimately became bigger and bigger where it was like, he would put me in, he'd like basically align me with like, like a distribution deal with like video action sports or these different places in Europe, extreme video and whatever it was. And yeah, he was just doing the deals with me and helping me out. And uh, for like the last three, that one, you said journal there as photo play and P and W all were like, yeah, we sold or at least printed like 7,500 copies, 10,000 copies of those movies and generally got, you know, use that money to keep making the movie again the next year and stuff. So worked out well. And then like he ultimately one day said, When I was actually in Montreal, uh, I think it was at IF3, Johnny and Tyler were there and they're like, so are you ready to stop making your own movie and come work with us? And I was like, I've just been waiting for you to say that. <laughs> so, and I said the only criteria, criteria I had was because I really enjoyed making that movie journal and the crew that we were filming with was like a really good group of people. So I didn't want to like bail on them. So I kind of said, if I'm going to come over, I got to bring like, three, four, five of my favorite, you know, athletes that I feel got my movies noticed is, you know, so, and that was like Dane Tudor, Charlie Agger, Riley Lebo, I think Joe Schuster, Brandon Kelly, a few, you know, handful of us all yeah. came over to those. Yeah. It was awesome. <laughs> all who ended up being like the A-lister of the poor boys movie for the years to come. Yeah. It kind of turned out well. It, it was, it felt like a nice synergy between all of us. And I had like, that was all Johnny and Tyler being like, let's do it. And I was like, Yeah. So yeah, I remember he flew me down to LA and was had a contract and he's like, this is what we want you to do. Do you want to do it? And I was like, well, I suck at surfing, but yeah, sure. <laughs> so <laughs> say I'll surf down there and I was so bad, still am. But uh, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, that was kind of how that all began. And now it's time for another sponsor break. Jace Keys is a company based out of Burlington, Vermont. Their business model of making limited edition graphics keys that are sold online directly to consumer is super dope. As a fan of original graphics, I love it. They put a lot of effort into making great skis, but also in making them look super good. I finally had the chance to try out my vacation skis this spring and I gotta say I love them. They were so playful that after shooting a jump I had to go in front of the lens and hit it myself. Knowing how much time and effort Jason Leventhal and his team put into each ski they produce, I'm really looking forward to their upcoming releases. Support companies that support skiing. Support J skis. And that help that he gave you is so big because nowadays um, there's no barrier to entry, right? Where if you put something on YouTube, it'll get noticed and Totally. 
that that's it but before that with the success of your sales and the reach that you get is dependent on distributors on shops on a lot of things that maybe a 21 year old jeff is clueless about totally man like i love to like figure it out of myself but if not for johnny and the other dudes around that like i would <laughs> you know he had the fact that he just like i said like would young kid would send these, you know, DVDs or VHS tapes. He didn't have to watch them. He didn't have to email me back. And the fact that he did, like, just kept me so motivated and more motivated. And that was alongside a lot of the athletes that I was filming. I think they were just as excited to know that maybe this, like, you know, guy like Johnny DeCesare was watching him for like, them ski for a few minutes or something. So, yeah, I always look back on that and be like, yeah. And when people approach me now, I'm like, I have to give them, like, the time of the day because like ultimately someone did that for me mm -hmm. with the years that you've worked with tier three um you've worked with some people that had a lot of influence or that ended up you know having a big impact on free skiing like i had the same thing last week re-watching a meathead movie yeah, yeah and in the movie there was like lj will wesson uh, clayton villa uh, you know nick martini the list goes on and you're like yeah you were talking about like a farm team yeah totally it, it seemed that way for you and meatheads where it was kind of doing a lot of great stuff you were kind of pushing the big companies in the back saying like hey uh you know like some of the biggest uh some of the best urban was done by meatheads at some point and not level one or poor boys so totally. they were kind of pushing i'm looking at the the dvd of journal which was your last film in there there's charlie Ager. Brendan Kelly went on to be a great cinematographer. Frank Raymond, Joe Schuster, Dane Tudor, Godbu, Max Hill, Josh Stack, Riley Lebo, Matt Margetts. Yeah, yeah. They're all still doing a lot in skiing, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. What influenced me a lot when I started making ski movies was the fact that a lot of people were doing them from big companies like uh, matchstick tgr to level one poor boys into smaller ones like theory three meatheads and local ones in quebec where you it seemed some like it was possible you know it wasn't as if there was only msp and then nothing else where it's kind of too far away totally how was it for you with theory three when you started what was your perspective for me when i started it really seemed like something that was feasible yeah if you get good skiers like i, I saw the movies and i kind of analyzed analyzed them okay, there's X amount of segments, X amounts of shots per segments. There's some street, there's some park. Forget about the po the, the powder. We're in Quebec. It's not going to happen. Anyways, yeah. what was your thinking? Because before you branched off to Poor Boys, Tier 3 lasted six movies, you say? Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah, and like obviously a few of those were made when I was more on my parents' dime going through the back end of university. But uh, as well as just like, we did have a couple little sponsors, you know, paying us a bit of money and we did sell a few movies. So it kind of did help. Um, I, the, like the biggest stepping stone was to be honest with Johnny and getting us some like real distribution. As soon as we had distribution, we could get more sponsors. As soon as we had better sponsors or more distribution, more athletes wanted to join. So it kind of just like incrementally stepped up. And just because I had, I guess I wasn't, I just was around enough people that were pretty good at skiing. I could kind of like always, been pretty observant so i'd see what they're doing on the movie side like i met berman down in um hood back when i was jumping and like doing my thing and i was like still just paying attention to what they were doing and how are they like you're saying how i'd analyze their movies i'd analyze snowboard movies and try to figure out okay what did a lot of it we'd watch absinthe absent snowboard movies back when we were like the heyday of theory three with like building the big booter thing and we probably <laughs> watched this movie pop i think it's from 2004 And Travis Rice and those guys, they were, Nicholas Mueller or Gigi Roof would build like the biggest jumps. And we just got so obsessed with that. So that became our like, okay, if we can make half the movie like super big jumps, people might take notice because it seems like people like to watch that right now. And, you know, we had Charlie who wanted to push the whole switch thing. So like people started to take notice because of that. I had like some great friends like James Heim, who was becoming an elite big mountain skier with MSP, but he was still filming with us. So people would watch our movies because... They knew who he was in MSP. So it was kind of like, yeah, little stepping stones until like, yeah, like I said, Johnny was able to like get us enough money from distribution that gave us the chance to like go sell ourselves to different sponsors and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. 
sponsors help yeah it's a it's a whole virtuous circle where totally you you need a, a stone somewhere to make it you know so it starts turning but once it starts turning then everything is a bit easier yeah exactly piece by piece and it was really all like the, all those athletes were just as motivated as me i probably pissed them off enough to be like let's get out and film more <laughs> but uh <laughs> generally speaking they you know they were all young and stoked and young and dumb like me and just wanted to you know have ski movie premieres and go drink beer after and get fired up <laughs> <laughs> journal is the only movie i've seen from tier 3 it still is one of my favorite movies and that, yeah. for a lot of ski movies i don't i wouldn't say i have favorite ski movies or it's a hard thing to say it's more a lot of times segments you know yeah. there's a s certain segments that hits uh, that hits hard you know And for a lot of ski movies, it's there's not really something that holds it all together, you know? There's really variations through the movie. Totally. And for journal, it's really something. I want to have your opinion on what, what it is. For me, it's like the ultimate feel-good ski movie. I watch it, and it's not the biggest park shoots. It's, it's not the biggest street features, but it's all really enjoyable all the way through. Yeah. I, I One thing I even try to do, well, obviously, we still try to nowadays still try to shoot the biggest things possible and all these different things but something i've always said for making movies and one of my time my future that ended up being like solomon and stuff like that was like i skiing to me is fun and watching skiing should be fun like there are artistic things there are amazing stories but ultimately if i feel like throwing a back then a dvd on or now just something i feel like watching like just casually it skiing should be fun And uh, we, I know when we were always like editing these little like 33 movies and in Poor Boys too at times, like w if the story isn't there, just lean on the good times of it because ultimately we all go out skiing for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of, at least with that movie, I think you're right. It, there's another one I made called Photoplay that has that same kind of tone to it. And I think, yeah, it's easy for people to just throw on and put your smile on your face. The music is good. The skiing is pretty good. You know, a few things are really good, but then it's like, yeah, just an easy, I don't know, maybe puts you in the mood to go out yourself. Let's say you're watching a ski segment. There's a lot of things that you can enjoy about it. There's the skiing, there's the filming, there's the editing, how it's put together. And for me, a big aspect is the song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find that a lot of my favorite segments that hit hard are songs that really reach me. It yeah. might not be the best filming or editing or even skiing or all together, but if the song is great, it, it sticks. And I was rewatching the, the trailer for Journal oh, yeah. with that song, Taste of Celebration, yeah, and yeah. I, I still had it in mind. Yeah, yeah. How much, how much uh, effort or energy or, you know, how much thought do you put into your soundtracks when you make movies like that? Big time. And Alexi would know this because I, even Poor Boys guys, and I like exactly what you said is the case for me like there's so much music like those two are just go hand in hand together all the things but music like can put you in such a nice place and all of i think it was a challenge one for me to like find music that hadn't come out yet and could you pair it because i do find you can find a really cool song you hear it all the time but then sometimes you put skiing to it it doesn't work as well but then mm -hmm. sometimes those things just go together so well that you like they become Yeah, uh, they're just one in the same so that you instantly picture skiing when you hear the music or vice versa. You hear that song when someone starts to drop in. And that's always been a challenge of mine. And I'm sure for everyone, but like I really was pretty obsessed with trying to find new music that I hadn't heard, but then also try to find songs that, uh, yeah, I don't know. They just fit skiing. And they always, sometimes there was a song we put in the last year's movie, Follow the Forecast. And I think it was Alexi that found it. And he's like, oh, I found this song. It's like kind of different. And I was like, okay, cool, man. Like different's good often. Like it could be cinematic. It could be punk rock. It could be something else. It doesn't really matter. But as soon as I put, I like listened to it and I could hear this like tone, I just started feeling like I was going to go ski powder. So it puts it ended up being a pow segment, like a Callahan segment we did last year. But it was probably the most asked about, like we've had emails about it when the movie came out, like the amount of comments, like what's that song on YouTube. If you're right now, like it's always the same, like 26 minutes. What's that song? What's that song? <laughs> you're like, you could just read the credits, but <laughs> uh, it's in there. <laughs> but uh, that, you know, it's funny how that is like, as soon as he found it, I was like, Oh, I'll actually found like a gem. And it's not like a normal, like ski movie sounding song. Mm -hmm. It just has this vibe that you can 
I think picture yourself being there with them because the tone matches the skiing and the skiing matches the music. So it's always been like, it's probably even like I was just doing it like today and yesterday going through some new music and I like you get that I kind of get that like tingly stoke because you're like oh this one's in the movie now for sure because it's just got something to it that's exciting so yeah and it makes like you're saying and it becomes like so iconic and there's so many movies and segments and things that I was actually to be honest like uh we were filming this year with like Sam Cooch and Odin Nelson and we had a quick bite to eat at a photographer's house and we threw on a whole bunch of old ski movies and as soon as that song like it was like Teddy Bear Crisis and then we watched some old Poor Boys movies and those certain segments that came on that had that like most iconic music it was like almost like I was back 15 years ago like yeah. re-watching those movies as a kid so that was and music is such a in the action sport outdoor sport world of it can be so great but that was even even in other forms of like documentary filmmaking it, you know, of music evokes emotion. So when you can pair it with the right scene, it just really, you know, can hit home and make everything that much better. And now it's time for another sponsor break. Access Board Shop is a ski and snowboard shop based out of Saint Sauveur, Quebec, Canada. They've been in business since 2002 and have supported skiing since day one. From sponsoring numerous athletes to putting on competitions to helping out movie productions, they've done it all. Axis is the core board shop and they've got everything that you might need this season. Check them out at axisboutique.com or go check out their shop in Saint Sauveur. Support companies that support skiing. Support Axis Board Shop. You talked about how some songs might seem great, but it doesn't really fit the skiing. Have you ever had the other way around? It happened to me a couple times where I hear a song and I have the vision and I know it it could and it will be really cool when edited. And then totally. I show it to skiers and they're like, ah, I don't really like it. And then you're like, just give me a chance. Give me a chance. And then they ended up talking to you after and they're like, yeah, it's dope. You are so right. There's been, I, I won't name names, but over the years of Poor Boys, I'm like, yeah, I got a song. They're like, oh, can I hear the song? I'm like, yeah, because you know, everyone's got an opinion before they see your vision, at least. And it, hey, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But there were times. And then I'd be like, just let me, let me try. Let me make the segment. The, exactly that but until they like saw it they're like i don't think it's gonna work my, it's not really my vibe and i like would make it and it was yeah there it was ended up winning this guy like a powder award a big one and i was like mm -hmm, see, you <laughs> there's always what i say to people is there's a difference between what you like as a person versus what represents you as a skier yeah i agree and what represents that skiing like it's so interesting mm -hmm. how like i was saying they like all of a sudden like come together when you can't Some people are also super visual and some people are not like they can, like I would say Alexi and Stan have become very visual working with me. Um, and they can like picture something the way we're, and I think that's also probably why we work well together. Like you can kind of talk through something and they can see what you or I are trying to say. Um, and there's other people that can't. So that's why I think with like ski movie music, when an athlete would like something or another producer, you're like, well, let's just like, let's try it out. Let's see it, you know, otherwise you might, it might not work or it might work way better than you think. So. That's a part of the editing or the post-production post side that really took a lot of time for me because I was too, I wanted to find the right jam. I wasn't ready to settle on I'm, yeah. something that might fit a half, you know? Yeah, it's um, the worst thing. Like, there's times even like we found like some really awesome tracks in the Every Day is a Saturday movie. And then they like couldn't get licensed or they were too so expensive or something. And I'd be so bummed because then we'd like go through, a, like, I don't know, hundreds of songs trying to, and you'd already kind of edited that and got like so stoked on mm -hmm. one or two segments. And then you're like, yeah, we lost the rights to that. And you're like, oh my gosh, okay, we'll find another one. But it's so hard to remove yourself sometimes from like seeing an edit. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. It's like so unfortunate when that happens. But let's talk about that. Every day is a Saturday. As a someone from a younger generation than you, I'd say, I didn't grow up on the early 2000s Poor Boys movie. I think one of the first one for me might be War, maybe a bit yep. before that. Yep. So I grew up, you know, War, Yeah Dude, Reasons, and so on and so forth. Yep. I'd say Every Day is a Saturday is probably, if you, if you would ask me, the best Poor Boys movie. Sweet. From mm -hmm. the ones I know, like, you guys really hit it you hit a home run that year with like some skiers that you brought on some skiers that they already had on. Uh, tell me about that year. because I'm looking through it 
through YouTube right now to like kind of refresh my memory, but there's that classic Tim Durchy segments where yeah. where he's like throwing dubs everywhere. There's Dane Tudor's first like big segment. Yep. There is a park shoot segment with everyone throwing down some incredible stuff. Yeah. It was uh it was a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> was, I, I definitely I remember can still picture being in LA in uh at Johnny's place. And we're like, wow, we got a lot of good footage. And yeah, like you said, just as it was coming together, because I was working on segments, Tyler Hamlet was working on segments, Cody Carter was working on some segments. And we'd be like, just because we sat like back to back, back, and we'd be like, got to check this segment out. You get super stoked. And it was like the whole movie was that way. Like, like you said, Dane's like was just crazy. Charlie Yeager had like probably some of the best footage I've ever filmed of him. Uh, like Pete Alport, who's from Oregon was filming Tim Durchy. And then, like you said, we had even our park shoots, just the vibe. You had like young guys like Nick Martini and just, just a whole bunch of people that like hit it off really well. It seemed like, and I think it, it a lot of things just went right in that movie. And uh, yeah, I remember when we made the trailer and it was just like put out and I, it was the most I'd ever seen like the internet of skiing, like it stoked. Like that trailer, even when I watch it now, is just like six shots, six shots, six shot. And you're like, that is some pretty. And it was all like with that, aside from being just like cool skiing, a lot of like really big tricks were mm -hmm. kind of like coming out like from different people in different ways. So it was just like an onslaught of like crazy skiing. <laughs> yeah, like ski movies were really about progression for a lot of years. And yeah. I think this was like the tipping point of the height of the progression in terms of uh, speed, but also, you know, just in the, in one year from 2008 to 2009. Yeah. Like the contest game was going big then, like the backcountry skiing game was going big. Like you had just a whole host of everyone. And a lot of the contest guys were starting to get into backcountry skiing or wanting to film like in a different sort of way. So yeah, there's some, it was definitely the tip of the, at least from what I remember, the tip of the progression point. Yeah, it was kind of a mix between an older generation like Andreas Hadvai, Charles mm -hmm. Gagne, and then new guys, the the younger ones, Martini, Dane Tudor. Yeah, it was it was it was cool. I definitely, yeah, yeah, that park shoot you referenced down at Mount Hood was like so much fun. I remember <laughs> it was just like there were a lot of skiers there, which normally that's not a totally a great thing, but it was like maybe twelve or thirteen people, mm -hmm. whether they ended up in the movie or not. Like it was just like really fun to watch the like full like session going on and watching new people do new things like that had never i yeah. remember nick martini saying something he's like i just did three new tricks i've never done before or something like that so yeah why do you say it's not necessarily a good thing when there's too much skiers sometimes uh, attitudes can get in the way and people wanting to like negatively one up someone mm -hmm. but i think I think uh, that time it was a really good vibe and uh yeah that one went really well there was no like at yeah, weird motivations from people. It was just mm -hmm. literally like sweet jumps. Let's go film and see what happens. Yeah, maybe a a challenge for you guys to f keep everyone happy. Can be, yeah, because people go to the park shoot and risk injuries and spend a lot of time and energy. And the more scared there is, the less you're guaranteed to have a shot in the movie. Definitely, there's different agendas over time. I've seen come up. So yeah, that's just the way it is. That's life in general. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen that in urban where you go on a trip and the more the years got on, the more it was like, let's say uh, 2010 or before that, you could see some uh, multiple people have shots on one feature in the streets. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really like standards or anything. And then as it went on, it was like, not only is there only going to be one skier having a shot, but there's only going to be one shot because if there's more than one, it's like too much. Totally. And yeah then it's a struggle because when you go in the streets, you need to have a big crew to help you out to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But then people are not really happy if you're five and then only one people, one person's hitting a spot. It's really kind of a trying to balance out, keeping everyone happy, keep, that everyone gets their shot. It's a, how do you deal with that when you film on your side? Like, let's say you go to a booter session. I'm guessing like people want to have the first hit shot when you know you land in the landing and it's it's perfect or how do how does it work on your side honestly maybe i'm just lucky now um we were talking about it this year filming um that maybe it's because everyone's getting old 
no offense to everyone, but <laughs> uh, the, the, the vibe of filming with the blank crew uh, is so awesome. It, it goes back to like my days with Solomon Freeski TV, actually, where you'd go out with a goal and the goal wasn't to try to like one up one another. It might naturally happen because that's just like the human skill. Like you kind of want to try something new when someone else is like vibing on it. But like the go out with the teamwork mentality it, this year with blank was like uh, incredible. I think that's because there's lots of mentory type people in them, you know, and I'd say Alexi and Stan have moved into that realm. You had Eric Yorlison and Chris Rubens who are obviously at that level. And you'd bring different people into there that might not be either skiing as well or confident in that terrain, whatever it was. And you would lose a lot of that like agenda, like, well, I want first hit or this and that. I think there's always going to be a little bit of that like selfishness because you ultimately would love the like perfect line but I've, this year i saw so many people just be like oh no you got it i've got a couple of cool shots on this trip you go snag the best one possibly you know mm -hmm. and i was like we were out heli skiing with uh like doing a big cool i think it'll be an awesome fpv drone style segment with alexi and anna and like yeah it was awesome to see like alexi working with anna to like line her up on like the best feature and you know alexi had a really good season so he's kind of like yeah whatever and uh same thing in other places like no, I got a really good shot last one. Like, Ian, you go and shred that one, you know. So it was real. I love that right now. And if that can continue, because <laughs> we'll, we'll, it honestly makes a better product when you're watching a movie. Like, you get more of that natural good times vibe mm -hmm. when people are actually having a good time. Um, and that translates. And I think that just comes from the maturity of a lot of the people and passing that maturity and outlook on skiing to some of the younger people. Um, and then it comes from just like also trying to not have to make a movie that's only about action, even though obviously it's mainly about action. Like those types of trips and stories that I did with like Mike Douglas and stuff, I think helped st steer me in a way that kind of helped steer some of the other people now. Um, just to be like, yeah, skiing's cool and rad shots are rad shots. Don't get me wrong. And Deep Pow is awesome and Big Tricks are cool, but there's a lot that goes into it. And if we're, you know, all the other stuff that goes into it is just as important. So I think everyone just starts to be a little bit, they have less agenda than I've noticed in the past, which is awesome. And I, I don't know if that's other group, groups of people. I'm sure they're, someone might say I'm full of shit, but I think our group, it seems to be working really well together. So what I think worked on my side from what you just said, and that seemed to be the case with you is you do a lot of segments centered around trips or locations, and that might help because if you're just working on your solo segments, then you're counting up your shots and you're like, oh, I need to get it to a number that's big enough to warrant a segment. For Whereas sure. when you're on a trip segment, you're enjoying it and it's a team effort. So you're not, you don't have the sole responsibility of stacking shots. It's everyone's business. I think, yeah, when you're building those types of segments, like even when we're out with ABM this year, he was still thinking of it in a positive way. Like I got to get this, I got that cool shot. But you know, you know, like you do have little mini athlete segments within yeah. segments, but it's definitely like, oh, okay, I didn't get it today, but that person did. That's okay, you know, because you're making a better movie. Or it's like, I'm really tired today and I'm not skiing that well. That person is. Let's get that person some more like banger footage or put the like time into that person because they're just skiing at a better level. I've saw that a lot this year and I was like really pr proud <laughs> as a guy that's been around this. And it also just, I think, Yeah, it just makes you want to go out more days. Because then if if someone else is a bit um, helping the other person out, then I want to go out an extra day to help that other person out. Like, I don't know. It's just like we're all in it together. You were mentored when you were younger. You had your time. Now with uh, you being uh, older than uh, people like ABM, you're mentoring a younger generation. How was it for you filming with uh, someone like ABM who is accomplished in the streets, is accomplished in competitions, but is still kind of new to that whole aspect yeah. of backcountry skiing? Yeah, yeah, no, t totally. I filmed with ABM first time, I guess, three or four years ago. And it'd be, I'm sure he would say it didn't go over super well. <laughs> he filmed well, uh, but him and I definitely had, we butted heads a few times because he was at the top of his game and I feel like I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> and But he then got buried in an avalanche um, whatever that was two years ago. And I'd heard his perspective had changed and he pulled me aside and told me all about the story and, you know, how his perspective on the backcountry changed a lot. Um, and filming him with this year, he was probably one of my favorite people to film with. I was like, 
his ability to just pay attention, ask questions, like the best thing he can do when you're playing in big mountains and you're maybe not the most experienced is to ask questions. He also went out and has spent more time doing courses and like I said, just paying attention and put it, even if he's not the most knowledgeable, which he obviously is gaining knowledge, but I just was really impressed with him this year. One, he also like, <laughs> I felt bad. I put him into like big mountain skiing lines because we were doing this FPV segment, like I mentioned, and he's not like a big lines guy. And he was going out and doing like straight lines and hitting like mandatory cliffs, like where you have to know how to ski and find your landmark and hit an air while an, a race drone is following you. And it's a bit, bit more hectic. It's not like your normal filming, which is a little slower. It's more like, okay, the drone is ready. Three, two, one. Okay, go, 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 go. You know, it's a lot less like the athletes telling us what to do. It's like mm -hmm. the race drones telling you when it's ready to be in position. So, um, ABM, like I give him like an A plus plus this year and I only hope to film with him more. I, I think we were supposed to do a whole bunch of booters this spring, but it's turned to crap around here. It's been like raining and cloudy for the last three weeks. So, but, uh, yeah, I think he got some awesome footage this year and hopefully, hopefully he enjoyed working with me this year. because I really did. So, yeah. Yeah. I think he, he really did. He talked to me a bit about it and he was really stoked on his season. Nice. Um, yeah, ABM is really smart. He's a smart guy and he loves skiing. I think he was brought on to park skiing and street skiing because we're from where we're from. So yeah. we, we don't have much choice, but yeah, I, I think he really seems to be enjoying the, the powder yeah. side of things. Dude, he goes out ski touring and sledding. Like I'm just impressed with his, like, even if you were not filming, he's just out exploring, like, That's exactly what I like to do. And I was just like really impressed with him. Like he, I think he's got a big upside in this, this aspect of it. because he's obviously not super elite, like, um, park skier. So to put that into his already abilities in the back country and his growing knowledge, I, I, I think he's going to do really, really well. Mm -hmm. And it always seems good to vary your skiing from on the competition perspective. Uh, The first thing that always comes to my mind is Henry Carlo did the Inspired Tour where he was riding shitty hills yeah. and he did his nose butter triple that year after yeah. riding two months of shitty hills. You know, it was kind of, he was in a right space or happy yeah. place. I don't know. He was just stoked. And yeah. it was the same thing for ABM this winter where I know for the last year almost he only skied POW or almost only POW. He got to X Games and finished fourth in Big Air and Slope style, but with a crazy performance. Same thing happened to Aaron Blanc last year and this year. He came up and met us um, to, you know, uh, ski powder up here in January. And he basically was like, man, I'm so burnt out on training. I need a break. He's like, let's go do some filming. And I was like, yeah, it's going to be pretty mellow. Just ski some pow, do some mini golf, some pillows. Like, we'll keep it, you know, pretty tame other than it's going to be deep. And he came up for a week, shredded pow, and then he went and won X Games, uh, <laughs> and, you know, the next week. Or you're like, holy moly, man, you're good. But then even this year, same thing. He was up at Baker skiing some pow and then went and I think, what did he do? Get second or third. You're like, it's so awesome to see. Oh, he won this year again. Did he win this year? Yeah, he won again this year. And But he then, like, went and did real well on another couple right after skiing some pow. And I'm like, I, did, I think it was last year when we were talking about it. And he's like, I need that break. He was telling, we went to Vermont for another like head trip. And he was talking about how like going to just like release himself from like pounding the pave, pounding the icy pavement of the pipe to like just go back and fall in love with skiing for a week to then go do his job part of skiing. You know, I th I'm sure he said something along the lines of it just put it, it made the half pipe skiing more enjoyable. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's really a different perspective for for a competition versus filming where both aren't true, but they're true at the same time is that there's more focus in competitions in landing your trick. You don't really care if it's the most beautiful you've ever done because yeah. you, you got to land it versus sure. in filming, you want to land it and it's going to be hard, but you want it to look good. Yeah. That's why you're filming it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's very true. So it so. kind of balances out it out to do both. Yeah, probably calms style down because you're like get into that flow of skiing, and then you're back into the rigidity that is contest. So let's get back to your uh, your career. We were talking about every day is a Saturday. Yep. Then you worked on Revolver. Yep. Tell me about that movie for you. Yeah, it was a good movie. Lots of good skiing. I think that one was 
didn't go over as well as every day is a Saturday for whatever reason. Um, parts of it I love. There are segments in that movie that I think are so insane to watch. And it still did well, and people seem to enjoy it, but I don't think it had the impact as the movie before. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was longer as well. I've always, I get a little nervous with movies getting a certain length, especially if it's like an athlete driven movie, like yeah. where, you know, you are really just watching footage <laughs> stacked up against each other. So I think that one was like more on the 70 minute length and every day Saturday might've been like 55. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, so that, that's definitely one thing. But yeah. Yeah. 70 is starting to get long for ski porn. I think so. Yeah. I think uh, Lexi and I always say that well, like even 45. Yeah. 45 is like, you know, you throw a little thematic thing to glue it all together. I think that's where I like find my happy, what I find enjoyable when I throw on a snowboard movie or a surf movie, yeah. unless there's a greater like story story. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like 45 for me. I haven't watched Revolver in a while, but the two things that I always remember from that movie is the Jossie Wells segment. Then it comes back to what I was saying about songs is because I don't know. I love that song. Yeah, I love that. Uh, one. What you need from me, or something like that. Yeah, Rich Hill or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I found yeah. that one on like an indie, like hip hop blog. <laughs> But it, it it just hits with the there's a little um going on, yeah. Um, yeah, and the intro where you show the production of a ski. Oh, yeah. That's that was really cool. Yeah, I've always wanted to do that again, like even more insane. I've like uh, actually was talking to Head about doing something like that, and I used Revolver as the example because like, i wanted to do that with like uh like crazy sound design and even like more like techni techie and yeah so two sides into ski intros there's like the lazy way i'd say which is not lazy it's just like the simplest way let's say where it's you take b-roll you take uh you know the, the yeah, easy way and then there's the complicated way where i think about long story short Where mm -hmm. Berman did like contraptions. I don't know how you call the the, the rigging that goes on for that. Yeah, it's really yeah. complicated, and that shoot looks into that side for me, where it must have been complicated. Like, tell me how how was it shooting it? Uh, it was awesome preparing it. Uh, it was kind of like uh, so Tyler Hamlet and I went out, got invited up to the Line slash K 2 factory in Seattle, and we had already like kind of planned what we wanted to do, um, but. We didn't know exactly. We've been in a factory before. So we were like, okay, we're going to rig up cameras in weird places and go through the whole process. I remember the first day, I think we shot it over two days, but we had like a, we'll call it a scouting day. Like the first day we got there, uh, the head engineer guy uh, took us through the whole thing and explained how we did, we're going to do this. So then we went and bought, rented a bunch of lights, some extra rigging, and we're like, okay, we'll just go step by step for two days and film it all. And just refilm processes, you know, and stick cameras in the weirdest places we could or, like, try to find a cool way to shoot it, you know. Um, so that was, yeah, that one was kind of, like, funny because we didn't plan it, but we, like, because it was just Tyler and I and kind of had free reign of this sick prototype factory, we were able to, like, um, yeah, just do it. I actually still have the ski we built in my office. <laughs> so it's pretty sweet. It's got like poor boys on the bottom and stuff. But yeah, it was uh, just a fun one. Weird one. You kind of had the keys to the place. A little bit. And they let, I was like pretty stoked. They kind of just did what we needed and let us, you know, obviously if we we're going to break a really, 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 really expensive machine, we wouldn't put a camera up there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, or they're like, we might break your camera. You're like, ah, fuck it. Might be cool. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was pretty fun. Um, Was it inspired? I think I heard that back in the days. Was it inspired by the what's the name? War. Damn, Nicholas Cage movie. Oh, Lord of War. Lord of War. Was it inspired by that? I think so. Maybe actually, uh, definitely a little bit. I remember Tyler and I talking about that. It's funny you bring that up. I think we did say like a little bit of this Lord of War like style. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe. Because yeah. for people who aren't familiar, it's this movie where Nicolas Cage is like a arms dealer. Yeah, is that how right. you say it? Yeah. Um, and the intro is seeing the process of a bullet being made to a point of killing someone at the end. Spoiler yeah, right. alert. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what you did. The intro for Revolver is you see the production of a ski from beginning to end. Yeah, basically. It comes Wood comes out of a box, and then ski goes back in the box, <laughs> and then you're out. Yeah, and everything that happens in the middle there. 
and it was really fun to film because I, again, had never really like spent that much time seeing a ski being made. So that was just kind of like a cool thing in its own right. So, so question I have for you, most projects I've done have been not solo, but either solo or two people. So it's not too complicated to split work or split, uh, you know, going to a certain shoot or another one. How was it with Poor Boys film versus Theory 3 or just Poor Boys in itself? Um, making a movie, but where you're multiple fil filmers having to plan out different trips, different shoot, different writer segments. How was it? Do you Did you split in terms of trips or were you like, okay, I'll be working with Dane all winter and I'll be working on the Dane segment? Yeah, for with Poor Boys, it was kind of like... Um again, just to probably save some money is like, I'm in Whistler, so I can film like five to six, to eight guys up here, people. And then um, we had some people down in like Oregon, like Jay, uh, Ginger, to some people in Europe. Uh, and then Tyler, who at the time was living, I think in LA and Denver, uh, Bull, Aspen, splitting his time. So he would float around a little bit more. And then So I kind of would have athletes join us up here. And then there were a few trips that I would go if it was like much more of a non, a trip that was at a Catskin Lodge or like a trip to Japan or whatever, then filmers and athletes would go on that. Where I, I think that one, we just generally said, okay, we got good guy here, good guy here, good guy here. And then we can bring people to those uh, cinematographers, shoot a bunch. And then we have a few floating other filmers that would go join people in other places. That's a cool formula. You have filmers in different spots and then writers go from filmer to filmer. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of that. Like, I mean, I've definitely sledded with a lot of people that never sledded before. <laughs> and I'd probably, I watch lots of different people get really upset with snowmobiles. <laughs> so, How's the experience? Uh, I've never gone into, uh, you know, the sledding territory. How is it for you? Uh, or tell me about a funny story you might have or someone being a complete noob and sledding and you having to uh, help them? Oh, there's like so many, like, and most of the time I'm pretty nice still. Uh, other people won't, but we always let you like, even this year, you're like, I feel bad. ABM in this year, I think he rode his sled off twice, <laughs> pretty much <laughs> watching it tomahawk down the mountain and stuff like that. Uh, the worst, best story I ever probably had was uh, a guy came out filming. I think it was for every day is a Saturday. He was like a bartender uh, up in uh, Whistler. And he was always super nice and really hyped on skiing, you know, like big time. And he wanted to get into filming. I was like, oh, yeah, maybe we can have you tag along sometime. You know, we always, um, again, mentoring, want people to like learn. Also, it would be sweet to have two, three angles, whatever it is. Uh, so we brought him out. Um, and he, it's like going up a place called Rutherford, which is actually a groomed road. And uh, so it's not very hard. But anyways, he gets his sled off the trailer and we all just leave and it's flat ish get up and we all kind of stop around eight kilometers and we're like oh man i wonder where this guy is i don't know if i should say his name miles and he had just bought this sled off like abma and it's like never been used by this fella and uh anyways I'm like man why the fuck is it i'm like all right i'll go back being that i was the one who invited him out and i think we were paying him to be there but anyways i come around the corner and another sled net guy was like Hey, 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 are you looking for your buddy? I'm like, oh, yeah, what's up? He's like, uh, pretty sure his sled's on fire. I was like, uh, what? So I come around the corner. There he is. And you can see like this black plume of smoke. And you're like, oh, my God. So you come around the corner and there's like 20 foot flames. And he's filming the snowmobile burning <laughs> to the ground. And it's actually, maybe it's in journal. It's actually maybe the hidden end of journal. If you were to put that on, you might see it burning to the ground. Or maybe every day is a Saturday. One of those two movies, it's like just burning to the ground. So. I'll have to go watch for that. <laughs> yeah. But what what made it burn? So he, oh yeah, so when uh, yeah, an emergency brake on, they had like a handbrake you can lock. Uh, it froze on, froze on like overnight because it was just a cold night and he didn't realize. So it was basically, he was sledding with his handbrake locked on and uh multiple people I know have uh, burnt sleds down. Damn. So, actually, I'll give you one. I'll throw Alexi under the bus because that's fun. So we're taking Alexi out. Prior, actually, it might have been every day is a Saturday year-ish. And uh, we're out again. He got all the way out there. We filmed all day. And it was like a pretty big group of us. And he was leading the, the way out. 
And all of a sudden he just like abruptly stops and I kind of like slide almost into him. I'm like, dude, what's going on? He's like, hands are up in the air. He's like, I don't know, man, it just stopped. I was like, okay, weird. That's weird, man. Like, did you check your brake? He's like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, all, not, it's nothing wrong with it. I'm like, okay, walk over. And it was like steaming, kind of weird. I was like, whatever. Go over to there and I like, and I've had an engine season, my old, old sled. So I was like, I just tugged on his like uh, pull cord. And nothing happened. It just like didn't move. And I was like, what? I'm like, he, I'm like, yeah, your engine seized. He's like, what? Starts freaking out. Pull open the uh, side panel. I look in. I'm like, Alexi, you literally have no oil in your snowmobile. So he starts freaking out. He's like, I just got this thing tuned up. And I was with like a couple more like veteran guys. This photographer, Brent Hughes, we all like kind of like congregate. And he's like, Alexi is freaking out. He's pretty upset, obviously, because it's an expensive machine to like break. And yeah, we got to tow it out. And it's a like 25 kilometer tow and all this. And he's like, I just got a tune up. We're like, dude, he's like, I got oil in it. I'm like, it's not like there's different oil in different places. There's chain case oil. There's like oil that goes in the reservoir, all these things. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm like, he's like, I got a tune up. I'm like, it's not like a car where if you go get a tune up, they put oil. And he's like, I'm like, have you ever put oil in this reservoir? He's like, no. I'm like, it's because it was empty and you just burn it. to Yeah. So sorry, Alexi. I love that one because <laughs> you just look so young and just pat him on the back and you're like, oh, it sucks, buddy. There's 2,500 bucks <laughs> gone. It happens to you one time and then it doesn't happen again ever. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure Alexi fills it up every time now. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. How much of a mechanic have you become by studying? I'm not that good. <laughs> I definitely know how to fix little things. How about that? All the things that you might need to fix, we can figure it out. After Revolver, you end up going and work for Solomon Freeski TV. Totally, yeah. How does that come about? Uh, it's a good story. It's kind of sucked for Johnny. Mike Douglas came over to where we were. We were editing Revolver in Worcester that year, and he... Um, Mike came over to get some footage for Solomon Freeski TV, I assume, from what I remember, um, of the Solomon athletes. And he said something. He's like, Tyler said something like, oh, how's things going? He's like, oh, I got to hire someone new. The other guy's leaving. Uh, and Mike said some, like, laundry list of things that he wanted. He's like, oh, someone that can snowmobile, someone that can ski tour, someone that can whatever, film, edit, color, music, blah, 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 like a long list of things. And Tyler looks over, he's like, He just described Jeff. Mike looks at me and I was like, hmm, interesting. So, and I, not that anything was really all that bad with four boys. Obviously I had a blast doing it, but I'm always kind of like observant to like the next step in my life. And, you know, Tyler is poor boys productions to me other than Johnny. And like, you know, I wasn't going to try to like step on his toes. Like it, I am still actually work with Tyler a lot on other projects now, but I didn't want to get in his try to be a dick or anything in his way. I don't know. It, I, so I saw an opportunity and uh, I hit up Mike after sometime, maybe a month or two later as the movie, like, we had a world premiere and I was like, you know what? I kind of want to do something different. And I just like I sat down with Mike and had watched a few free ski TV things, like some of the more trip stuff, like that was like crafted by Mike. And I was like, yeah, like making ski porn is fun and all. Um, and I'll always still enjoy that. And I still do to a, so much I, i'm not jaded towards it i actually love filming it and editing it but i was like i want to find a little bit more story or a different way to do things rather than like athlete 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 so mike was doing it song free ski tv and was like starting it sounded like it was about to blow up and the old internet was you know really taking a, mm -hmm. a turn a changing ski media like or all digital DVD style outdoor sport media was changing instantly. I remember that at Revolver. And I was like, hmm, kind of feel like it might be a good idea to get in with Solomon here. And so yeah. Mike, Mike took a chance on me and hired me. That's cool. As you said, you were working on the classic ski movie business model. Yeah. You, you film for a whole winter, you produce a DVD, you sell it and rinse and repeat. And then you go to Solomon Free Ski TV evolved a lot through the years, but it started out as a web series with not much budget i guess or you know it, it, i guess it progressed totally. but at the point where you got there and the years following it really became it seemed like there was a lot of money put in and a lot of effort totally. put in to produce uh short form content stories uh, how would you define what it was because it, it varied a lot i think it was like a constant evolution which was 
why it was fun. When I got there, it was kind of like beginning to be, it was like they were just leaving what they had been doing, which was like borrowing footage from all the major movies and doing like more of a like, hey, this week on Fallen Free Ski TV is a look into what this guy's been up to. A little bit more of like an old school TV show in a web form to Mike doing his own like stories and trips with the Solomon team and diving more into those own stories. And that's when I came in and I guess it was in season four and a half, five, and then five, six, seven, eight, nine, I worked on and yeah, I just kept evolving. And that was the sweet thing. It started a bit more that way, like a bit of that first thing I was saying, but then it like completely evolved into us like pitching, well, Mike, myself and whoever Anthony at the time was working there to Solomon sit down with like these creative ideas and a like full creative freedom to try to pitch something you've always wanted to do Mm -hmm. you know whether it's a crazy trip something hyper creative or maybe even if it's just good times action whatever it was it was like I love that evolution and then even on the back end of that that we had that like you know five to nine minute model for the first couple years and we were producing I think 15 to 20 of those things a year and then it kind of slowed down and we're like, okay, let's, how's it going to evolve now? And like the film festival circuit was starting to, you know, become a bigger thing um, with like the short film aspect of it. So that was more like season seven, eight, nine, where we were pitching longer ones that might have a bit more of a film fest vibe to it, or just even like taking one or two of the ideas that we had been working on and expanding them deeper and, you know, sending them into, you know, film festivals and all that stuff. You really went from the ski porn style with Theory 3 and Poor Boys to working on, I don't know how you would call it, because it's not necessarily storytelling. There were still some trip-oriented episodes and stuff like that. But how was the switch for you uh, to work on more, like, I'd say brainstorm and try to do some new ideas rather than repeat a ski porn formula? Yeah, I think that was the fun thing again about it. There was like, if you took 15 shows, there was like, three ski porn ones, a couple trip ones, a couple that were like a true story, all of that stuff. So I think that was the probably the best part was to sit down and brainstorm all that. Mm-hmm. Mike definitely challenged me a ton and I learned a ton from that challenge from him, from the other people that we worked with just being thrown into it and go, all right, you got two weeks. You Sometimes we didn't even know the story. We had a trip and you were required to figure it out in the moment dive into you know start interviewing people and really like craft a mini documentary on stuff Mm -hmm. that's the best way to get good at something is like throw you into the fire and go all right you better have something pretty good good and that challenge those guys all from bruno and solomon and ben adian and that group of people to mike douglas and the guys i worked with at switchback like that's what i love the most and took me i at least feel like took me to the next level and is like what i now like try to impart on other people so that's dope What's your, your standouts from your time at Salmon Freeski TV? My favorite trips, there's lots, but some of my favorite ones, just because it was super unique and I got put in a new place that I'd never been, was uh, a Norway trip. I had to go like ski tour. I was never really, I don't know if I'd really ski tour. This was like probably nine or 10 years ago, either eight or nine years ago. Now I ski tour like an absolute ton and I love it. it was like with like Greg Hill, Andreas Fronson, who's passed away, like and Chris Rubens, we're all like backcountry dudes. And yeah, Greg Hill, who like climbs mountains and Andreas, who climbs down them and shit. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so out of my element. But it was so, it wasn't even like the skiing, it was skiing was all the same, but it was like their like fitness and their like passion for walking up a mountain was a lot different than mine. <laughs> I was used to snowmobiles. Uh, but uh, yeah, like going there, we traveled around on a boat and it was like, you just like use your binoculars or the topography map and find zones and talking to the guide, be like, does this go? And you'd take like a Zodiac over or like part the boat and you'd walk and then ski tour up. That one will always stand out as just a unique, unique trip that that type of trip, that uniqueness has now like got me so fired up on doing my, finding my own ways to do that. Like mm-hmm. and different trips associated like that. Um, and then like we did, uh, what was it called? Um, one that was just really kind of unique. We pitched the idea of like bringing a kid, uh, like it was called the dream trip. You could win and then come on a trip with us. Like we got to meet this rent, like literally drawing names out of the hat. And this guy joined us in Japan. Like, Oh yeah, that was so cool. Yeah. And the kid, the guy, Nick is so awesome. And it's like, because the world's so small and so interesting, his brother came out and stayed with us here at my house here in Pemberton and like they're from Germany, like little son. I was really, you know, that's what's great about skiing. You can tie people together. So that one's awesome. Probably my favorite one I ever made was the burn, which is like a 
four cycle of a forest fire. That one. Yeah. That's like, one I had noted. Yeah, that one was like a heady idea that took us a while. And I'll give Mike credit, allowed me to pitch it to Solomon. Solomon actually wasn't into it. They didn't understand it until we made it. And then it won a bunch of awards. Still is like something people talk to me about like after the fact. Uh, I've, we got interviewed by like a, a major mountain film festival that thought it was real. And I had to break the news to them that it was fake. <laughs> <laughs> It like went, to, it got bought to like tour a bunch on like uh, high school tours, like about like uh, ecology and stuff. So that was pretty cool. My favorite one that has introduced me to Stan actually was, uh, the, it was called Moments Notice, which is purely like ski porn, but it is the concept of could you leave tomorrow and go anywhere in the world where it's snowing and you just roll the dice kind of. And that was cool because we, you know, I was, it wasn't it was fully scripted in the fact that we knew we were going to go somewhere and I'd been watching the weather, but we'd call up like, athletes and be like uh, can you pack your shit up and go somewhere tomorrow and it was so interesting hearing the likes i feel bad like what kai zackerson out in europe was like i called him and he was like so sad on the phone because he couldn't go <laughs> and i just was like i might feel like i'm being such an ass right now like breaking his heart being like you want you can't go to japan where he's like well i got kids and a family and i'm like he's like but i really want it oh man and it was just like it was pretty fun doing that and just calling up random athletes on the team and being like yeah let's go ski pass like we did that one twice that those were just fun because you're looking at a storm five, two three days out and being like we're gonna just go see if it's gonna be awesome and the first one we did was to japan and i called up young stan ray and he said yes and it, we arrived and it was like 80 centimeters overnight minus 12 still to the day probably the best snow i've ever skied at this place called rasutsu so wow. we talk about it being like what a lucky yeah, and that and that's when I became friends with Stan. So yeah, and that concept is super relatable because as a pro skier, you're always on a moment's notice for the good yeah. snow. But then also for most uh, people who have a nine to five, that's the dream. Of like that was, th there's yeah. a snowstorm, but you wish you could, but you can't because you have a job. That was the pitch exactly. I'm like to me, that's like the even as me as a guy that like does this for a living, it's still my dream to be like drop it all and go to that place on a moment's notice. And we do that a lot. Like follow the forecast is the same concept, mm -hmm. but it's like I love that feeling. And when we play that episode for people, you can see it's like oh, I just want to do that with my three friends. So yeah, yeah. After Solomon Free Ski TV, you worked for Origin, which is a marketing agency yep. specialized in outdoor. Like yep. outdoor marketing, let's say. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, after again after five years with Mike, it was going super well. I had, did work with Origin and Mike. Uh, they were a client kind of of Mike's, or they worked together. I worked with them often. I would do a ton of work with Origin, and they're like thirty or forty people. They're based in mainly in Vancouver, but also a little tiny bit in Montreal. And uh, yeah, I got to know the whole team down there, the two owners, super well, and. Just again, being my observant self, I was like, okay, I've been doing this for a while. I think it's time for me. I was having a kid. Uh, so I was like, you know what? Maybe I should not travel as much, do all that whole thing. So I went to them. I They had posted that they were looking for like a director of video. And I went to them and said, hey, how about I come there? And we take your idea of doing a video department to the next level. Mm. And uh, ultimately, they, after a bunch of back and forth, because they felt bad because... <laughs> Uh, Mike and them were all close friends, and ultimately, I did go over there. And yep, and for through I worked there for two and a half years, and uh, ultimately, it went super well. I learned an absolute ton. Probably the probably oh, I take something from anywhere I work, but that one I like branched me out into not just like filming and mm -hmm. like creative directoring within video production, but like the whole process of how to raise money even better than I was doing it before, how to pitch things at a level that. I can get people to sponsor a ski movie, but have all these other side deliverables. It's like taking blank now to like a full content production level based on my knowledge from yeah. working at Origin. They, I give them huge credit. They included me on like everything. They threw me into the fire again, which was awesome. I like yeah. that. Learn fire by whatever it is and uh, trial by fire. And then, yeah, so that went well. And then, but ultimately I learned I, as much as I like that uh, whole process, I wanted to make ski movies. So I pitched, a ski movie again and we made a ski movie with origin and that was what sealed the deal for me wanting to go back on my own so which I'm, was uh the black home movie yeah it was for black home magnetic movie so um which was just crazy timing because that was the year right as we pitched it whistler black home got bought by veil 
which I'm not a big super fan of Ale, but nonetheless, uh, they we made that movie, and it was like the last hurrah of Whistler Blackham, and uh, it was awesome to see the community get fired up on it. And but like I said, that was ultimately why I went back to my old life a little bit. I had the same thing of working in an agency, and it really changed my on a different scale than you probably, but as as yourself doing my own productions where you're centered around, oh, what do I like as a filmmaker? What do I want to make? Then you work with other people, you realize, well, how do I work in a, a project with a lot of people involved? And yeah. then eventually when you get in an agency, it's really centered towards the client. Yeah. What what does the client want? How, you know, it, it changes your whole mindset or perspective as to, sure. um, you alluded a bit to that with blank. Instead of, uh, if, instead of being you and Mike D, pitching to Solomon what you want to do, then it's kind of trying to see what the client wants or what, yeah. what would the, make the client happy. Exactly. And that's how we've even been able to grow blank quite exponentially quickly because of that mentality, like shifting it. Like, of course, we want to do what we want to do and like make a badass ski movie and excite people and do all that. But when you're like paying attention to what a marketing director or person or creative is saying from their side, you can kind of honestly merge and synergize those together uh, in a way that I don't think people realize. And then all of a sudden you both get what you wanted mm -hmm. and you get, to be honest, you get better stuff because you're both passionate about what you're ultimately working on. So yeah, that was my learnings from origin and how much the two owners, Danielle and MJ entrusted me there. I will, I owe them so much and thank them. So I would love, yeah, I, it was great, great learnings. But then I also, missed making ski movies and having full creative freedom of my own. So here we are. <laughs> here we are, 2021. You've been working with Blank for a couple of years now? Yeah, as I left Origin, Alexi said, hey, would you be interested in editing our movie? I didn't film anything, I just edited. Um, and then as I was going, I was doing a whole bunch of other projects, as I still do, uh, lots of different kind of brand content things. Um, But then as that evolved into the next year, they asked me to be way more involved. And then again, the next year, more and more involved. And then this year, I kind of pitched the idea saying, hey, you know what? I really enjoy working with you guys. You want to do more this year? Um, and not like I was producing and directing and, and mentoring Alexi and Stan as much as I can. Um, but this year, I definitely stepped in a bit more with those guys and Alexi to like try to raise a bit more money, really be involved in like the directing side which i was doing from afar before this time was way more in it we went on for an hour and 30 but i feel like we could talk for another hour and 30 so yeah, yeah. i'd be really glad to do a, another episode with you uh next fall and talk about your upcoming movie with blank and the all the projects you've got going on because um yeah. as you said you've been doing a lot of brand content i've been seeing uh, videos with ed head yep yep popping up there you've kept quite active like I, i see everything you produce and i'm like how does he get all of this done in the winter it's busy yeah so definitely i work a lot with a guy down in the states now mike rogi who's a uh, a writer publisher editor he has the magazine mountain gazette now and he was the former editor at the ski journal and i do a bunch of fishing content ironically with him a ton actually and it's some of my favorite stuff so i do that i do obviously a bunch of short films with head and tyrolia And yeah, just a whole host of little things, little different brands, Mike Wigley's Heli Ski, a bunch of stuff. They come and go, you know, yeah. and a lot of them I try to merge into blank now because I find that most fun. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. will there be a fishing segment in the blank movie? Man, we're all pretty bad fishermen, so pro hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. It'll be a, a blooper segment. Blooper for sure. Thanks a lot for coming on, uh, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it was super fun. I haven't reflected on all that stuff in a long time and I... I look forward to some good banter with Alexi and Stan this fall, and we'll, we'll fill you in on Tales from Cascadia, the new Blank movie. So this is it for episode 19 with Jeff Thomas. It was really good chatting with him. I'm really looking forward to this fall to chatting some more about filmmaking and skiing with him. Big thank you to this episode's sponsors, Axis Board Shop, Tree Fort Lifestyles, Planks Clothing, and J-Skis. Peace.